It finished Arsenal 1, Fulham 1 at the Emirates Stadium, Brian, and two controversial moments in that second half that led to the two goals. We go to Arsenal's first, Rob Holding standing on the edge of the six-yard box, um, perhaps obstructing the, the view of Ariola, the Fulham goalkeeper. But then Kedia came in at the far post, stabs it home to uh, level the match. Do you think the VAR made the right decision in allowing the goal to stand? Um, I think as the rules are generally interpreted, they probably did. But from my point of view, uh, and I'm sure Scott Parker felt the same, I thought Holding's position um, would have affected the goalkeeper Ariola's ability to make the save. I mean, it was an excellent save, but it affected his ability on how far he got the ball away from the goal. I think there was a Fulham player in the direct path of the of the the ball. Maybe it, the ball went to, the, to his right hand side. I think Holding was in the position where the goalkeeper was certainly been affected by his presence because he was so close. So for me. You know, I know the interpretation, but I I don't think it's correct. I think that in that situation, the benefit should go towards the defender and not the attacker, and uh, it should have been disallowed. But I, I'm not surprised of what what the interpretation was. And if you look at it overall, Arsenal probably deserved a draw. Fulham played well enough as a defensive side. Didn't do an awful lot with the ball. Didn't really make any clear-cut chances in the match. Got a lucky penalty. Arsenal didn't create many chances either. So, I don't think either side deserved to win the match. It's just a bit unfortunate from Fulham's point of view in that they're involved in the battle and scrap to try and stay up. But I don't think it'd be good enough anyway. Yeah, because we'll come back to Arsenal in a moment, but looking at that Fulham team and the way they've played across the whole season, you know, it's looking pretty much now that they're they're doomed for relegation. It's hard to see how they'll fight back at the at the time we speak now. Of course, Burnley have to play Manchester United. They could lose that game. Gives them a little bit of faint hope, perhaps. But across the season, looking at Fulham's performances, they haven't scored a lot of goals. They haven't got a regular goal scorer. They don't really deserve to stay up, would you say? Well, it, it, the the teams that finish in the bottom three don't usually deserve. There's very little, uh, very few times after when you look at how oh, they were very unlucky. If someone goes down a goal difference or narrowly by a point, you might say they were very unlucky. A lot of injuries or bad decisions against them on the last day. But overall, you have plenty of time over a, a 38 match league to to get what you deserve. I mean, Fulham didn't start the season well. I think they'd only won victory in the first 10 games. And it took a while, a long time for them to get going. I think they adjusted their style of play. Initially, they were trying to play a more, let's say, exotic style. They were trying to play a more adventurous, attacking style of play. Eventually, Scott Parker decided to change it round. Got some players in. Uh, window was still open was able to get some very good loan players in who have improved them and uh, helped them to get some good results and th- there was a stage where you're saying well Fulham could do it but now they've fallen off the last few games narrow defeats and I think the Wolves one was a big big result a 90 minute goal by Traore a bit of a wonder goal from a strange position an injury time to, to, to lose one nothing to Wolves that was a, it was, it was a big result against them but you know Overall, you look at that situation, what they're on, 26 points, they're gone. It's not going to be enough. They need to get too, too many points, get one today. They need to get three today. And uh, they're running out of games now. And you said about goals. The goals haven't scored enough goals. Um, I think the top scorer is only on four. You know, and that, that, that says something about it as well. But I think they will be in good... good um, situation to regroup if they go down and have a good season next season and come back up. I mean, they come back up as a, from winning the playoffs last season. They finished in fourth place. So, But I think they'll be in better better circumstances if they go down this, this time. The manager will be a better manager, more experienced manager. He'll know the players better. He'll know what's required in the championship even more than he did the last time. And he'll have a better evaluation of his of his squad based on how they've performed this season. It's interesting you say that because, of course, Scott Parker took over when Fulham were really doomed for relegation the last time from the Premier League. And I don't think, uh, well, he wasn't really expected to stay up. But as you say, he came straight back up from the Championship 
takes him into the Premier League. Not such a great season this season. Just listening to some Fulham supporters on podcasts and that kind of thing, there seems to be a bit of a divide between supporters at the moment, whether they should stick with Scott Parker or whether they should look to another manager. But from what you're saying there, you think that they should stick with Scott Parker. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, Fulham have made some very strange choices um, in recent years when they've mm. been in trouble. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Felix McGath, who I thought was a very strange one at the time. And he, from conversations I've had with one or two players who were there, it was it was it was quite a strange existence working under him as players. But they have um, they you know they've been a bit of an up and down team for several years. Their best period was probably under Roy Hodgson, who did really well for them. They got to UEFA uh, Europa League final, final. Europa the League Cup final, final. UEFA Cup final as it was then, mm-hmm. um, and performed extraordinarily well that season. And were very good, earned a place in that competition, of course, and then went on so far. Went, went actually went to the final. So. Um, I, I think Scott Parker has done a, a good, steady job. As you said, he wasn't going to rescue them last season. Uh, this season and the, the end of last season, uh, sorry, the, the season before last season, he did a good job to get them up. Um, the end of last season and this season have been um, unique in many ways in in modern football, mm. in the fact that there have been no crowds in, uh, at the games. Clubs are obviously struggling financially. They've had to adapt to all sorts of circumstances, adapt adapt to training under uh, strange circumstances, preparing for matches in difficult situations. So I'd give everyone a bit of a free pass to a degree. But I think Scott Parker has done all right with what he's had. I don't think I, I, I don't think if um if uh, Jurgen Klopp or Guardiola were managing Fulham this season, they would have done miles better with the squad of players they had. So I think he deserves another go at it, by all means. Arsenal are looking forward to that uh, Europa League semi-final against Villarreal. Their old coach, Unai Emery, in charge of the Spanish side, of course. Uh, they've got Everton next before that game. <clears throat> and I was saying to you off microphone, Brian, that I feel that in these kind of situations, you want to keep getting positive results. Like having a result today against a relegation threatened side isn't going to help Arsenal and their confidence going into such a big match. And we know how big it is because they're facing no European football for the first time since 95, 96 season if they don't qualify to the Europa League. So what's your take on the result today and how that might affect them going into that semi-final? Well, well I think I think the result today puts even more emphasis on the Europa League for them. I mean, I've been saying this for a long time. Realistically, the best route to European football is through the, the, the Europa League this year. Um, be it that, you know, if they could win the Europa League, that Champions League place is still there. But otherwise, they don't see. They don't look like they're going to make to make the Europa League positions. And losing two points today has has probably extended the danger of that not happening. There's a few clubs ahead of them who are all in mixed enough form: Liverpool, Everton, Spurs. None of them playing spectacularly well either. But um, I think the Villarreal game is going to be a, a, a massive game for them. They've known that for a while. I think their emphasis has been on that competition to a degree because I think the manager realised that for a while back that was going to be a struggle to make the Champions League. Was he right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They've, they, I mean, that's the 13th... The, sorry, they've lost 12 games. It was almost a 13th defeat of the season. But 12 defeats in the Premier League out of uh, 33 games or 32 games is already too many. It's It shows a team who are brittle, inconsistent and who concede too many goals. They've not conceded as many goals this season they have in previous seasons, but they've still lost too many matches. So... The performances they were they were fortunate enough against Benfica. They had to wake up late on the game to rescue that match when they were two one down in the home game and uh, needed two late goals from Tierney and Aubameyang to get them through. They won that match three two. Didn't play spectacularly well against Olympiacos either. They won the away game three one late goal uh, by Elneny. Uh, gave them a little bit of space with the the 3-1 lead, three away goals, of course. Then they lost the home game 1-0. So, you know, it was touch and go against Slavia Prague, the home game again 1-1. Went to Prague midweek and put on one of their best performances of the season to win the match 4-0 on towards the night. But then you go to today and another wishy-washy performance, I'd call, call it. So it'll be it'll be tough one for them. Villarreal, seventh in the league, not having a brilliant season. They're doing okay. 
Um, they've got some experienced players and um, a manager who knows Arsenal knows the players inside they wouldn't know the young players that well because he didn't play them they were only starting to come through at that stage will that go against them though will it, and I, this might sound like uh, the, the words of uh, somebody who well I obviously haven't managed Brian but you'd have better experience when you come up against a team that you maybe have a little bit of a bad history with that you're more determined there's no doubt about really. that Stephen yeah. Yeah, I mean I, have, I never had it because I never managed anyone else I never yeah. managed against Pats I left Pats and I kind of always felt that in my head I'd had 10 years there they've been so good to me yeah. the supporters were always very loyal to me whether we're winning or losing and uh, you know in my head I always have, have had that one so I can't ex- I can't talk about that but I, I I did occasionally have games against clubs that I I probably felt a certain amount of ill will against maybe maybe the pinch players off me in the transfer market that I didn't want to go and that we were underpaid for them when we went to tribunals on them and I would have been very disappointed and annoyed about that and I'd have been probably um I've been probably more wound up in the preparation in the week before that game than I would against some other clubs. And that you, uh, it, it used to help, it helped me, it helped me to get the players more focused on what was at stake. I would imagine, imagine that you and I, Emery, would feel a bit the same against Arsenal, mm-hmm. but it's a different level. He's an experienced manager. Didn't go great for him overall against, with Arsenal. Had a... He had a difficulty in his communication skills. He mm. did never got a massive grip of the English language. I think, despite his best efforts, I think he's a good guy. Yeah. But he was never readily accepted by Arsenal supporters. He wasn't considered one of their own or one of them or one of our great, great past players. And he was up against it. Um, but even the English media, I think, also. Yeah, had a, they did. Uh, but, but look, at in this competition, he's an outstanding record. Three in a row with Sevilla, uh, 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 Sevilla won the three in a row. He's uh, uh, in this competition. He's considered as 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 a maestro when it comes to Europa League and been able to win it. So you know, Arsenal, watch out against Villarreal. It won't mm, be easy. Certainly not. Briefly to ask you about Manchester City beaten yesterday in the FA Cup semi final by Chelsea. Is that the kind of result? that can then cause them to trip up in the other competitions they're left in the League Cup, Premier League and Champions League. Well, when people were saying, well, it's on for Manchester City, they're the most outstanding team we've seen around Europe for many, many years, I would have always, in my head, been saying, hold on here. It's another, is it, wait till you get to the business end of the season. It'll be... You can you can have a bad day. You can stumble. Not everyone's going to lie down as a lot of teams have when you want to win the cup competitions. They can make you can't stop them winning the league. They're going to win the league anyway. Yeah. But when it comes to the match, I mean, they play Spurs in the final. Spurs not having a very good season, but a lot of people would say Spurs can make it very awkward and win mm. and win the match we saw what can happen yes they plays Chelsea he rotated the team left out seven or eight players that played in the Champions League midweek Chelsea don't want to lose in the cup the new manager wants to win trophies knows the way it works at Chelsea if you're not winning trophies yeah, you'll be sacked even if you are winning trophies you might be sacked because if you don't win the main one don't win the league or you don't win the, the Champions League you'll probably be sacked as well so he's saying well I might as well give it a go try and win the cup he puts out a very strong team well set up made it very awkward for them and we see, we saw chinks in um, Manchester City, similar to the chinks we saw against Leeds in the last league game when mm-hmm. they lost to Leeds United. They were down to 10 men for a long time for, since the first half of the match. So, you know, suddenly there's doubts there. Um, they may not win. Mm. Well, they certainly won't win four competitions. They mightn't win three. They mightn't <laughs> win two. We <laughs> might be seeing, but it, it, it'd be an interesting finish this season, that's for sure. Makes it exciting. Just to finish then, Brian, look, we're light in detail at the moment because... All the news about the changes to European football happened while we were on duty commentating on that game. But I suppose in a more general sense, because a lot of these details have been floating around for a while now, where there was talks of a breakaway Super League involving Premier League clubs, Italian clubs, Spanish clubs. There was talk of changing the Champions League format. This all to me seems to me, you know, even if just look at the Champions League format, UEFA kind of moving the goalposts to kind of help out the top European clubs who we know have all mismanaged their finances. The likes of Manchester United, Barcelona, Real Madrid. Like, if you're a small club in Europe trying to make your way in European football, it just looks like downright unfair moves being made by UEFA to help these clubs out who have mismanaged their finances. It just doesn't seem fair. 
I don't I don't think it, it's UEFA trying to help out those top clubs. I think the UEFA are over a barrel with those top clubs saying to them, if you don't go with what we want, we'll go and do it ourselves. Now, ultimately, they can't stop them from having their own league and playing against each other. Somebody has got to pass it and say, all right, go ahead, you can play your matches. Uh, but what UEFA cannot do is they can't stop them going their own way in some way. They can stop them playing in their domestic tournaments mm. and their national associations could stop that happening. The Premier League could stop, say, the, the clubs who it seems are involved in this, Manchester City, Manchester United, Liverpool, Arsenal, Spurs. Um, they could stop them playing the Premier League. But what would the Premier League be like without them? So it's a very de- delicate situation for the Premier League and it's a very delicate situation for... Um, for 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 UEFA, mm. so UEFA have got to try and find some pro- compromise, and that's what we've seen. They had come to agree that compromise with the agreement to have a 36 team uh, Champions League of some description. But maybe now that's all going to be thrown into disarray. We just have to wait and see what develops over the next week, over the next few weeks. But it's it's not a very nice situation for the mm. domestic leagues if the big teams are all going to go off and do their own thing. Particularly, you know, the major... Th- like if you take PSG out of the French league, you take Juvent- Juventus out of the Italian league, maybe Inter and Milan... Uh, if you take Bayern Munich out of the German League, but particularly the Premier League, if you take five or six teams out of that, what sort of a league would that be? It'll be a totally different league, won't have the same income, won't have the same um, strength in the marketplace, the TV rights. The TV rights will go, will go to, the, the TV money will go to the strongest league, as it, as it currently is, that's the Champions League and the Premier League. But, you know, uh, changing times ahead, it seems. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Stephen.